Hi everyone, welcome to today. I hope you're all keeping well. You've had a good week and uh, rested after this weekend. And as we continue into looking into the scriptures, let's open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord. We give this time to you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And we thank you for your Ruach Spirit that speaks to those who are searching you, your word, your heart, and your spirit in these days. So Lord, as we go through these scriptures today, Lord, I ask you to continue allowing those who hear the Spirit of God press into you so that they can hear more. For your sake and for your glory, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, so, um, yes, another week, another way to learn the beautiful Gospels and also what Jesus did and what he went through. And um, we're going to be looking today at a subject about attacks. And a subject about carelessness. You know, sometimes when, as he did with his disciples, he modeled the way for them to be able to believe and also to be able to model what he was doing so that they may be able to bring more people into the kingdom of God. We're going to open up into the passage of scripture. But before we do that, I just want to open up in a, in a, in a scripture that will give us a hope and a future. And it's going to be taken from Isaiah chapter 35 uh, through. Well, I'll let you read 35 when we have gone through this teaching today. It will be a good opportunity for you to uh, go through that because it was speaking of not only the impending judgment on Zion, but also the judgment on the nations, which is in chapter 34. And in 35, it speaks of that a future glory of Zion, which is a wonderful way to open up these verses. And it uh, is a beautiful way that we can open up saying, Then the eyes of the blind shall see and be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. When you press into the Lord and you are searching him with all your heart, with all your mind and with all your soul, he reveals things to us. And it's something that can give us immediate answers to what we're searching for or maybe a delayed response in something that perhaps maybe we prayed for a lot earlier on. And as Jesus did with his uh, with the great multitude, he had compassion on them. You know, he had compassion on them because they were hurting. They were lost without a shepherd. And Jesus was in Decapolis, a Gentile area, which is what we're going to open up in. And this was an exception uh, to his general focus, which shows a couple of things. Not only God's flexibility, but his intense compassion for hurting people. So, you know, he went to a certain area, which was mainly for the Jews, uh, preaching to the Jews. But he also went to the Gentiles and spoke passionately to them, spoke lovingly to them and gave them a hope with healing that allowed them to have their faith and trust in him that's taken from matthew chapter 15 if we go to matthew chapter 15 verses 29 to 31 we can appreciate what it says so matthew chapter 15 verses 29 to 31 says jesus departed from there skirted the sea of galilee and went up on the mountain and sat down there a great multitude came to him having with him the lame, the blind, the mute, the named, and, the, and, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking them, the maimed made whole, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. The God of Israel. <laughs> the one true God of Israel. How we dear, hold him dear and lovingly in our, in our hearts, in our minds, and in our passions as we continue to grow but i just want to go into something that will allow us to go deeper into the scriptures because when uh, jesus was had compassion on them he had such a compassion on them that he groaned he groaned that intense groaning that was within his soul that he couldn't even understand himself but it was from the spirit of god that allowed him to be able to uh Go through that experience. And in particular that we're going to be talking about is uh, how Lazarus was raised from the dead. And I'll read the first few verses. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. 
And uh, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he, he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, I did not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone, and from that place the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who were standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And then he, now when he had heard, said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound free, hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him, let him go. As we dive into this passage of scripture, I just want to open up on a couple of things. A word wealth, for example, from Strong's Accordance 1690, derived from uh, in and brime, which is strength. And the word is used to express anger, to indicate a speaking or an acting with deep feeling or a stern admonishment. Let's have a look at a couple of scriptures that relate to these passages or these uh, descriptions that I've just mentioned uh, to you. The first one that he said was that he was expressing anger. And this is the groaning, the groaning of just that spirit groan. And uh, Mark 14 verses 5 tells us through the anointing at Bethany that since Denarius was a day's wage, the ointment represented almost a year's wage in this uh, passage of scripture. And Jesus turned around and said, let alone, why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. So what was happening is, is that they were complaining that they had taken what was worth a year's wages and poured and anointed Jesus. And he said, no, let, alo let her alone because she's done a good thing. Done a good thing in the spiritual realm, which people were looking at the physical realm. That was the first part, was that anger, that righteous anger. The second part that we want to go through is that exact passage of scripture that we just read, which was the death and the uh, resurrection of Lazarus. And in John chapter 11, verses 33, speaking of Jesus and the death, which is the last enemy. Let's have a read through that. This was speaking of him and his death. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Groaning in the spirit when one is troubled is something of the Holy Spirit that is working in and through each and every one of us. And raising Lazarus from the dead was not a, not a resurrection which followed endless life, but it was a resurrection from the dead of the physical life, which was reserved for the father who was going to uh, have his own son resurrected, future tense in terms of this context. But this was giving a new order of life that allowed those in Christ that could still look forward to the hope. So what he was doing is that he restored Lazarus to physical life, which would cease after his subsequent physical death. And as with others who have died in Christ, Lazarus awaits the bodily resurrection promised to all who are in Christ and are his people. This is speaking of the um, acting with deep, deep feeling. And when we do that, we do so with compassion, we do so with sincerity, and we do so with truth, as he did. You know, sometimes when we're praying in the Spirit, we don't know what we're praying for because it's our spirit that's groaning. You know, the other thing is also a stern uh, uh, admonishment. And in Matthew chapter 9, verses 30, when he spoke of the two blind men that were healed, they asked him, they said, the son of David, and that was a popular messianic term, often uh, carrying an intense nationalistic meaning. But, you know, Jesus avoided the title in referring to himself. However, he was testing their sincerity, eliciting a response, being Lord, because that's what it was all about. It was the Lord. Mark 1 Chapter 43 speaks of how Jesus cleansed a leper. And a leper defines those who have a wide variety of skin diseases. And as they touched him, Jesus exhibits the authoritative freedom over the law, which prohibited such conduct with a leper in the Old Testament. Jesus also showed that the healing never was to interfere 
with the teaching of Jesus. And as we go to that verse in Mark chapter 1, let's go through there quickly, hold on. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verses 43. Let's have a look at a kingdom dynamic which speaks of this wonderful opportunity for divine healing. The Lord's willingness to heal. Here Jesus declares his willingness to heal the sick. Some insist that we must always preface our prayer for healing with, if it is your will. But how can one have a positive faith who begins a request with an if? We do not pray for salvation with an if. The leper was certain that Jesus was able to heal him. He was not sure that it was his will. But Jesus' response settled the question, I am willing, be cleansed. May we not be certain that, the, that it is the Lord's will to do that uh, for which he has made redemptive provision. At the same time, one cannot intentionally be living in violation of God's will and expect his promises will be fulfilled. And where biblical conditions for uh, participating in God's processes are present, they must be met. But let us not avoid either God's readiness or God's remedies by reason of the question of his willingness, if it is your will, is more often an expression of fear, a proviso to excuse God of blame if our faith or his sovereign purpose do not bring the healing. If his will is questioned, leave the issue to his sovereignty and remove it from your prayer. Our faith may be weak or incomplete in some regards. We, in fact, may not be healed at times, which should never be viewed as a reason for condemnation. Nevertheless, in all things, let us praise him for his faithfulness and compassion. This is a great environment for healing to be realized and is consistent with the scriptures which reveal Jesus as willing to heal. Great passage of scripture as we close off that little uh, groaning, the word wealth groaning. And I just want to uh, read something else to you because, um, you know, just last week I was presenting a message about the healing and the 5,000 and how Jesus gathered them and he settled them on the shore and he, he gave the, blessed the food, gave it to his disciples. His disciples then distributed, showing that spiritual uh, discipleship modeling of being able to go out into the harvest and uh, bring those special souls into the kingdom of God. And as I prayed for last week of all those that are in need of healing and also the faith that needed to come just like Peter when Jesus said come and Peter walked on the water, kept his eyes on Jesus. But as soon as he started looking at his circumstances, he started to fall in and Jesus pulled him up and said, why? Why do you have little faith? Keep your eyes on me. This passage of scripture is that I'm reading to you came at a time of revelation that um, had an effect on my personal circumstances. So Mark chapter 7 verses 31 to 37 speaks of Jesus heals a deaf mute. Let's have a read through that. Mark chapter 7 verses 31 to 37. Again departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the regions of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loose, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should not tell anyone, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all these things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. A couple of uh, notes that I've made on that is that Jesus' personal uh, Jesus personally indicates to the man the ministry he's about to uh, perform on him. But he spoke the word of healing over him before he made it possible. But it was up to him to be able to believe for that healing process. 
The touch and the spittle represents Jesus' own life, which was able to be the source of the healing. This gains the man's confidence and encourages him to expect the healing. It's all about believing and expecting a healing. The words of the people may have been a simple expression of wonder and praise. Although some commentators see a deliberate reference to Isaiah chapter 35 verses 5 to 6, which we opened on, which prophesies the coming of the era of salvation. This is the case. If this is the case, then people were acknowledging the miracle as a sign that the age of which Isaiah spoke had arrived in Jesus. And that was a foretelling, a prophecy of what was to come. O Holy One of Israel. You know, God reigns in righteousness and in peace. And his messianic ministry is fulfilled in stages by his ministry, just like it is with ours. You know, I share a personal testimony because as you press in and go deeper into the Lord's love, he reveals things to you. And sometimes he reveals it to you, as I mentioned last week with another family incident where I was unbeknown to the condition. The same thing happened with regards to another family member, which was then giving me an insight as to perhaps what the spiritual need was. And that need was for the healing to take place. And in this passage of scripture where Jesus healed the deaf and the mute, gave an opportunity to see what the Lord is doing in these circumstances. It's so, so important for us. I can't emphasize this enough. How the more we get into his word and into his Ruach spirit through prayer and worship, the more he can reveal to us what he wants to do. But it's up to us to believe and to be expectant of that healing. Just like with the man who was healed that was deaf and mute. But like I said earlier, the healing doesn't take preference or uh, priority over the teaching of Jesus. Yes, it's a miracle. Yes, it's an insight. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's, it's him saying, I'm with you. Believe, expect. And walk in faith and continue to be fed the spiritual food that he wants to give us. As I was reading that, they kept on coming back some certain words that uh, is encouraging. Even though it's a very difficult time and situation, whether it be in health or the uh, world that we live in at the moment. But understanding the scriptures, we can appreciate that there is a continual reminder of what the Ruach the Spirit Ruach is saying during this time. And he's trying to tell us something. The deaf will hear and the blind will see. This is being confirmed. And as a messenger of the Lord, I want to pre prepare you and give you that insight and to be expectant for that healing. Because he wants to heal, but you've got to put your trust in him. And you've got to make sure that your heart is right with him so that he can bring that deliverance of the healing for you. It also gives us a bit of a, a warning that we must uh, take at this time. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12, it gives us a great, great opportunity of revitalizing and renewing our spiritual journey with him. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. That is what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. There's conflict in this world and then there's obviously the Ruach Spirit word that gives us uh, that everlasting covenantal peace that he has uh, in mind for us. But we, we seek that peace, but not at the expense of sacrificing holiness. We've got to continue renewing ourselves from the inside out. If there's something that's been plaguing us, layers with Jesus when he was groaning, may have been through anger, may have been through that deep feeling that deep-seated feeling, or it may be that word of uh, stern warning. Renew your spiritual vitality so that he can do a good work in and through you. But you've got to stay connected. You've got to stay connected. 
the next passage of scripture that we're going to go back to in Matthew uh, chapter 15 speaks of how they fed the 4,000. Now, remember last week we spoke of how they fed the 5,000. And in Matthew chapter 15, verses 32 through to 39, it says, Now Jesus called the disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such great multitude? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and a few little fish. So he compared the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks and broke them and gave it to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. Now those who ate were four thousand men beside the women and children. And he sent away the multitude and got in the boat and came to the region of Magdala. There's a word wealth there that we can appreciate, which is uh, the word fill. Strong's Accordance 5526, originally to feed or to fatten animals, Stoic philosophers began to hold the common people in contempt and transferred uh, Shorterzo from the uh, agricultural field to the dinner table. The word came to signify being satisfied with food in in abundance. Jesus had a ministry beyond the Galilee, and we're going to have a look at a couple of things because this may give us a a, a helping hand in terms of how we can continue with our walk and our our journey with the Lord. Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 30 tells us that he cast out the demon from the daughter of Syro, Phoenician woman. So he cast out the demon. That's the first one that I want to mention to you. As part of ministry work. Matthew 16 verses 13 to 19. Says that Peter made his great confession. At Caesarea Philippi. What's that telling us? Is that there's a confession. In the faith that we have. In our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 4. Verses 14 to 15. Tells us that Jesus went into the synagogues. In each community. On the Sabbath. He was teaching them. That's what we do. We are fed spiritually. We are discipled. And then we pass it out for others to be able to be discipled in return. And also to be able to see the Lord working in and through their lives. But it takes that commitment of saying, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. And then Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 8, where Jesus commissioned the 12 and the 70 to spread the word, the Great Commission. These are the great things of the ministry of Jesus that happened that allowed him to be able to reach the multitudes. You know, it wasn't just about uh, giving the Gospels to the old covenantal people, the Jewish people, but it also extended to the Gentiles, as we've just recently uh, learned. But Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 9, we're going to go through that again. Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 8, verses 1 to 9 spoke of uh, this context of feeding the 4,000. And as he spoke the similar words as we've just read in Matthew, I want to read a couple of uh, points that are made that will allow us to understand what Mark was um, explaining. He was saying that the feeding of the 4,000 followed closely to the pattern of Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, which was speaking of the the feeding of the 5,000. And apparently, according to the, the Gospel of Mark, The disciples' spiritual dullness clouded their memory of the former miracle that happened, which then made them have to be reminded of the provision. Remember, Jesus didn't uh, depend on himself for that provision. He looked to the Lord for the provision so that the Lord would be able to provide and get all the glory. But as we continued with the journey, we also appreciate that there was um, increased attacks. Increased attacks that happened, which wasn't... Uh, very good but the attacks were nonetheless still happening and this was happening in that region as we just finished off in Matthew chapter 15 of that region of Magdala when we finished off by saying that he went he sent away the multitude got into the boat and came to the region of Magdala 
taking from Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through to 4. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and tested him ask, and asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, When is it evening, you say? It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the, si the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. He was saying that they could understand the signs of the weathers, and because of the, the color of the sky, they could uh, determine what the weather would be like the following day. But not understanding the spiritual times that they were in. That is the fulfillment of the kingdom in the person of Jesus that was right before them and still right before us to this day. The resurrection of which the experience of Jonah with the fish is a type would be the greatest evidence of his authority is a great lesson that we can learn from that. Now Mark chapter 8 as we continue reading from chapter verses 10 through to 13. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000 and he sent them away immediately and got to the boat with his disciples and came to the region of Dalmathenia. Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Why does this generation seek a sign? They were blind. They were blind and they were not prepared to be healed. And they were not prepared to be uh, believing and expecting. We've got to appreciate that there's a, there's a Ruach, the living spirit of God through his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. They came to set us free. And if the healing doesn't happen instantaneously or in our time or our expected time, doesn't mean that he's not working. He's working in the situation even though you can't see it. He's bringing about the redemptive plan and work that he has for each and every one of us, if we believe. I can tell you many, many times of accounts and testimonies of how the Lord has spoken to me. But that's my journey. That's my journey with the Lord and I'm just sharing it with you to encourage you to go into the scripture so that he can reveal things to you and start speaking to you in a way that no one else can speak to you. That husband, that husbandry uh, whisper. The bands of and cords of love. But how do you do that if you don't believe? You first need to ask the Lord to come into your life and also through the process of baptism, allow you to be cleansed and washed. The Pharisees sought a sign. They wanted to see something physical that will allow them to believe. But we walk by faith and not by sight. And sometimes that breakthrough isn't seen in the physical realm. It may be seen in the spiritual realm by those who are tentative to the Lord's prompting and his guidance and his leading. If you are on the edge of deciding if you're going to follow the Lord, continue with your passionate, fervent prayers and worship and go deeper. Matthew chapter 16 gives us some more examples of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Matthew chapter 16 verses 5 to 12 speaks of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of little faith, why do you reason amongst yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves or the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leavened bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Sometimes there's a doctrine, whether it's a doctrine of man or a false doctrine. By searching the scriptures, we can get ourselves equipped to know and discern truth from error. And it's a journey that we all go on and continue working on and through that allows us to be remaining in him. The leaven that symbolized the false doctrine of the religious leaders, the Pharisees had a strong commitment to the law as interpreted by the tradition of the elders. They were strong ritualistics and were legalistics. The Sadducees came from leading social uh, families and were rationalists as well as materialists. They rejected the tradition of the elders and denied the supernatural, including the possibility of bodily resurrection, as with Jesus and the cross. And they were best known, both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, for their mutual hostility. As we continue to learn about these hostilities that happened then and still happen in our day today, we can appreciate that this is what the Lord wants us to learn and walk in during this time. Firstly, it's the spirit of love, the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit of humility that allows us to be able to walk in peace, not at the expense of holiness. But it's also for us to be able to bring others into the kingdom. Mark chapter 8 verses 14 through to 26 Again, spoke of the leaven and the Pharisees and Herod. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, you, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the th five thousands, how many baskets filled the fragments that you took up? They said to him, Twelve. Also, when I broke the seven for the four thousand, how many large baskets of full fragments did you take up? And they said, Seven. So he said to him, how is it that you do not understand? Mention a word there just now called hardened. In Ezekiel chapter 37, it speaks of how he will take the heart of stone and turn it to the heart of flesh because the hearts were hardened. And he was coming back to them saying, change your heart. The spiritual dullness could be, in our sense today, could be coming from a number of areas that uh, could lead us into a place of spiritual deafness and blindness. Leaven often was referred to as a term, as an evil connotation, being what may be small may corrupt the whole. And the context suggests, you know, suggests a link with the Pharisees demanding for a sign. And Herod's leaven embraces the evil that it was portrayed in. It was all about the godliness of worldly men, but not the God of uh, Israel. They had taken their eyes off Israel and looked to the world for solutions, for answers, for healing.
But with Jesus' ministry, there was healing, and that was done in stages. Where's our trust been over the last... Go back as long as you like. But let's go back over the last couple of years. Has your trust been in Jesus and his healing and his provision and his protection? Or has the healing, provision and protection been placed in certain man-made procedures or um, solutions? Whether it be from a healing agent or supposedly healing agent or from those in authority that would be giving those healing agents. Yes, we've been through a period of history where the fear narrative has caused a lot of concern, a lot of fear, and a lot of um, doubt. But hopefully through the right spirit and the living word and the message that I'm bringing today is that your doubt will be doubtless in his loving arms. It is vital to remember that we are born of God and we have God in us that allows God to work in and through our lives with Christ holding all things together. Remember Colossians 1 verses 17. If we hold, in, hold on to those truths, yes, we may need medical procedures to help relieve any illness that may not be able to be completely healed through prayer and fasting. So by no means, I'm not against anything that can help medically. But I, I do have my reservations when our trust and our faith is misplaced. Unnecessarily, that could cause further harm body, mind, and spirit, but, but God. He is the one that restores. He is the one that heals. And if we, like we all have during our journey on this earth, go through stages of learning, trusting, walking, hearing, if we've been in a situation that we may have compromised our health, whether it's body, mind, or spirit, we know that the true living God, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, as it did and said in His Word, and as He speaks to those who seek Him, seek His face first, put your trust in Him. And when you need to get that medical attention, you still put your trust in Him. It is a journey, it is a step of faith, one way or another. But my word of encouragement to you is to get into the scriptures to allow him to speak to each and every single one of us individually because that's what it's all about in the New Covenant uh, ministry is having you being able to have direct access with him, with our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We do that through a commitment. We do that through our acceptance and allowing him to dwell within us. Greater is he that's in you, that's he that's in the world. But you've got to stay grafted into the vine. And when you do feel that you are slipping away, call on a brother or a sister to pray for you. If you need healing, reach out and ask for the healing. We all go through this journey and it's a step of faith that we do each and every step of the time. John the Baptist was a very close disciple of Jesus and he was the one that was able to hear, just like the other closest disciples were, of all the things that Jesus went through. Whether it was in the Garden of Gethsemane by himself and going back to his disciples, asking them, why are you sleeping? Or whether it was his disciples in the boat asking the same question, except they asked him, why are you sleeping in the midst of the storm? And he said, peace. Peace. Be still. So when all these things come to plague us and bring us into a place of potential fear, be still and know that he is God. 
So as we close off today on the short message, we're going to carry on this, uh, later on. And we're going to be um, looking at further teachings. Further teachings that will allow us to be able to continue our journey with Him. Understanding the kingdom, the promises, and the transfiguration. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. Short and sweet as it is, the message is still clear. Trust in you, have faith in you, and follow you. So Lord, for all those that have been on a healing journey, we ask that you continue to touch them, heal them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bring healing to them. For those that have not walked closely with you, Lord, we ask that you draw them close to you so that they may be able to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For your glory and for your kingdom, we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, sending you love and we'll chat soon. Be strong, be courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go.